Welcome to a virtual Live Talks Los Angeles with Dean Kuntz. So first of all, Dean, I'd like you, without spilling too much, tell us about Devoted. Well, it's a story of a young mother, Megan, and uh, she's a widow and she has an 11-year-old boy who is autistic, never spoken a word in his 11 years. However, uh, he's got a rich interior life because he has a very high IQ. He believes his father was murdered, not that he didn't die in an accident, as claimed, and he's been searching the internet because he's a very talented little hacker. And uh, he's found his way into the dark web and to a potentially what seems to be a murder for hire site. And those people have found that he is looking into them. So there are some bad people coming from Megan and for Woody, her son, but there is an ally that they don't know about. And he's a particularly interesting one. His name is Kip and he's a dog with some very special abilities and talents. And uh, this is a novel about the human dog bond and about how the evolution of dogs may be, <clears throat> excuse me, co-evolutionary with ours. And we may be headed for a day in which dogs are more to us in the future than they seem to be now. Dean, you write a lot about dogs, especially golden retrievers. Uh, could you tell us where that comes from? Uh, I have admired golden retrievers for most of my life. I haven't had a dog as, a, of adult, as an adult until uh, the first one. We worked with Canine Companions for Independence, which produces assistance dogs for people with severe disabilities, paraplegics, quadriplegics. And they would offer us dogs that failed out for one reason or another. And we would always say, no, we're too busy. Uh, we know how much time a dog is going to take. I finally said to my wife, it'll be 90, it will be 90, and we'll be still saying we're too busy, we got to do this. So we have now had three uh, sort of, I wouldn't call them fail outs, they had a career change from assistance dogs to family dogs. And I've fallen in love with the breed, with dogs in general, and uh, I love writing about them because they're very mysterious creatures. You know, 30 years ago, scientists told us that dogs don't have our emotions that we anthropomorphize them when we think they do. Now they've turned totally around on that. They can see the brains lit up, a human and a dog, light up exactly the same way with the same stimuluses. And dogs do have our emotions, but dogs are also somewhat smarter than we've thought. And that's being shown by their ability as assistance dogs. And they may have the vocabularies easily at 200 words. I had a dog with a vocabulary I could confirm of 400 words. So uh, I, I'm fascinated with them and I get, don't get tired writing about them. We, uh, like I said, we have a lot of questions submitted by your fans. Um, one question I just wanna get out of the way early just cause a lot of people sent it in and that is um, um, a lot of questions about the eyes of darkness in a Wuhan 400. A uh, lady sends an email in, she says, I've read every single one of Dean Koontz's books over the years. One big question I would love for him to comment on is his Wuhan 400 situation in the eyes of darkness and the COVID-19 pandemic situation we're in now. Okay, well, I, I will say this. My reputation as a prognosticator is greatly exaggerated in social media, considering that I don't even know what, I can't even predict what I'm going to have for dinner tonight. Uh, so. You know, what happened is somebody married a page from another book and married it to a page from Eyes of Darkness. And I did not predict 2020 would be a pandemic. And the Eyes of Darkness is not about a pandemic. It does have a virus in it that was called Wuhan 400. And that's simply because when I was researching that, I found that there's a biological warfare lab in China outside Wuhan. And it made perfect sense to say that this troublesome virus had come from there. So it's a mere coincidence. It's not prognosticating. Great, very good. All right. So Dean, let's start uh, early in your career. What were you like as a child? What did you read as a child? Well, I grew up in a family where there were no books in the house. Uh, books were considered a terrible waste of time. And uh, that turned out not to be true for me, but <coughs> excuse me. Um, and however, I fell into reading, writing little stories on tablet paper, 
and drawing covers and peddling them to relatives for a nickel by the age of eight. So somehow or other, books were in my blood, uh, and I was interested in them. They became a great escape for me from a poverty, a house of poverty and violence and chaos. My mother was a great person, but my father was deeply troubled. He was an alcoholic and given to violence. So books were my escape, but they were also a way that I discovered how other people live. You know, when you're a kid like that, you tend to think every house is like this house. And you have to learn that it isn't. That there's something very unusual going on in yours. And books also showed me that. So as a kid, books were my salvation. And uh, I was in college when I sold my first short story and uh, suddenly thought, wow, I think you might be able to make a living at this. For a few years, it seemed like I was ridiculous for even supposing so, because I didn't make much of a living, but eventually it turned out all right. Who were some of the authors you liked to read as a child? You know, the first book I remember being enchanted by was The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. And I, I always thought I liked it because Mr. Toad and I had a lot in common. Uh, and it was a, a fascinating book for me. And then as I got a little older, I started reading Robert Heinlein's young adult novels, which were science fiction. Then it was Ray Br Bradbury and Theodore Sturgeon and some of the finest people in that field. And I read almost exclusively in that until I was, I think in, in my uh, early 20s, 20, 21, and then I discovered John D. MacDonald, and I read 34 of his novels in 30 days and was so saturated with John D. MacDonald that I sat down and wrote a novel that was so like John D. MacDonald, it was a half a step away from plagiarism, so I could never submit it anywhere. But it was MacDonald that showed me characters are as important as story, and he was brilliant at character. And it was there that I fell in love with just taking time to write character. So that had a profound effect. And then when I was a kid in high school and college, I avoided reading what teachers assigned. I was somewhat of a slacker in that regard. I was a class clown, both in high school and college, and uh, wanted to read only what I wanted to read. Um, and then when I was, gra after graduating from college, one day I decided to pick up something by Dickens, this guy I had heard about, and it was A Tale of Two Cities. And, I read that book, devoured it in about a day and a half, and finished it at four in the morning, sitting in bed with tears running down my face, and became then a Dickens addict, which uh, every 10 years I reread A Tale of Two Cities, and it remains such an incredible book and very timely even now. Dean, did the relationship with your father influence your writing in any way? Oh, I would say so, yeah. I say in a sort of backhanded way he gave me my career because I needed escape and so books came to me for uh, as an escape and without that father I wouldn't maybe felt the need to escape that house so urgently and then there was the fact that my antagonists in my work are they're not just ordinary sort of bad guys they're almost entirely um, sociopaths and that I think evolves from the fact that when my father first got destitute uh, toward the end of his life, my wife and I moved him to California and put him in an apartment, took over uh, care of him, and it was a very difficult time. It was supposed to last two years, and it lasted 14 years. Um, and in that 14 years, he was hospitalized a number of times for behavior. And one, the first time he was diagnosed as borderline schizophrenic with tendencies to violence complicated by alcoholism. Uh, but the second time after he had some problems with pulling knives on people, including me, he ended up in a psychiatric ward. And he was then diagnosed as a sociopathic personality. That showed me a lot about my childhood and opened the door to understanding of why all this had happened. A sociopath is somebody who feels no emotions as we do, but is very capable of faking them and is therefore an excellent kind of personality to be a con man. My father was a con man among other things, but uh, that I think is why my villains, I get so many letters about them that say, this is the most creepy, most terrifying villain I've, I've ever encountered. And then there's been this other book of yours and there's another one. Uh, 
And so he gave me that in a way. It's, it was, I think what I came out of it was all the bad things that happened to you in life are ultimately two things. They're ultimately material. And more than that, if enough time goes by, they're generally pretty amusing. Uh, there isn't much in life that you can't later find an amusement value to. Did you have any early mentors at the beginning when you were st starting off to write? Yes, when I was in high school, I, that was the time where they first started dividing you up. Who should go to college? Who should go to vocational school? That sort of thing. And I was willy-nilly shoved into the go to college class. And uh, our high school was, had a lot of kids for a small teaching staff because kids came from all over the county to be there. So I think there were 1,200 students. And because of the smaller teaching staff, I ended up with the same English teacher year after year, ninth grade through senior year. And her name was Winona Garbrick. She was a whack in World War II. She stood about five foot one and was an indomitable personality. Football players were terrified of this lady. And she was, in fact, a very strong disciplinarian, but she was also one of the sweetest human beings you could ever know. And she took a a liking to me and told me that uh, she had me do a class newsletter. Uh, she got me into making little tape recordings of amusing little stories that would be told. And she was sort of the mentor all the way through high school. And when she found out I was going to college uh, and that I had been accepted at a state teacher's college to major in history, she uh, stopped me in the hall one day. In fact, she yelled at me from the far end of the hall, Coons! And it was like a scene out of one of those Westerns where the bad guy and the good guy show down in the hallway and everybody scattered because they were afraid of her. And it was just her and me in the hallway. And she came up to me and put her finger up to me and started tapping me in the forehead with every word she spoke and said, I understand you, you've been accepted at Shippensburg. And I said, yes. And she said, I understand you're being going to major in history. And I said, yes. And she said, can you tell me why you're majoring in history? I said, well, I like history. And she said, yes, and it comes easily to you. And you'll always do the easy thing if, you're, if you don't wise up. You have writing talent and you should be majoring in English. And I was a kid that nobody paid attention to. And so it impressed me this woman cared enough to do this. Um, and I changed my major. So she had a very profound effect in my life. Dean, um, when you decided to take on a writing career, I understand your wife said, I'll give you five years. Um, yeah. so a couple of people wrote in and said they'd like to know more about those five years. <laughs> well, she, I had sold two paperback novels, I think it was two, and uh, quite a number of short stories. I wasn't making a living at it, but uh, I knew that the possibility was there. And Jurda said to me, look, I'll support you for five years. And if you can't make it in five, you'll never make it. I sometimes say I've tried to negotiate her up to seven, but she has Sicilian blood. So she wins every negotiation. And uh, I took her up on that for a, quite a while. I was considered bum by a lot of people in the family. And even some people I called friends uh, thought this was just appalling beyond words. But very gradually over that period of time, I started doing a little better and a little better. And at the end of those five years, Julie was able to quit her job and go to work you know, beside me. She, her background is accounting. She's very good with numbers. I can't balance a checkbook. So our talents meshed with each other. And toward the end of five years, she was able to quit her job and she was man managing an office with a lot of employees at that point. And she has said since that was sometimes the worst decision she made because when she worked for other people, it was 40 hours a week. And when she came to work with me, it's never been as little as 40 hours, but it was, uh, it's, I say, it's, it's so important to have somebody in your life as a writer, because this is such a lonely occupation that there needs to be somebody in your life you're extremely close to, that loves you and that you love, and that makes a very large difference and makes it possible to do this. So they were tough years, but they were exciting years because there was a slow, steady growth in those years. Dean, you write a lot about very dark moments and also about how good prevails. Where does that motivation or inspiration come from? Uh, 
I'm an eternal optimist. I'm the most optimistic person I know. And um, I, I do believe that, and it's partly what I saw with my father's life when uh, he would make uh, all these bad choices. And I think that evil works in the short run, but it never works in the long run. I can't ever see an example where it did. And as a consequence, evil is a foolish choice. Uh, and so when I write about evil, I try to show it as that. It doesn't make the bad guy any less scary if you realize at some point he's really a fool. In fact, if you can kind of laugh at him a little bit, uh, it does two things. It makes him even scarier because we're not accustomed to laughing at really evil people. And it makes him more human that way. Uh, and secondly, I never want to glamorize evil. I don't want you reading a book and saying, bad guy was really cool. I want you to say that about some of the protagonists, but not the antagonists. And as a consequence, if I can show you they are a little unintentionally humorous, that takes the shine off that glamour of evil. And uh, that's sort of why I handle them the way I do. Devoted, for instance, has a whole pack of very bad guys, but many of them are quite amusing in a dark way. The heroes in your book, uh, a writer sends in, are often overlooked and under-recognized. Uh, is there a reason why you seek out characters like that? Uh, yes, I think what they mean by that is, I have a lot of characters who are ordinary, in ordinary occupations. They're not ordinary people because I happen to believe no one is actually an ordinary person. Everybody is unique and has something different to offer. But I tend to pick for my heroes sometimes a bartender, uh, a short order cook in the Odd Thomas series, um, a, 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 a gardener in The Husband. Um, but also I have a lot of characters who are people with disabilities because for years we've worked with Canine Companions for Independence who produces these assistance dogs for people with severe disabilities. And one day I realized you never see these people in regular fiction. If you see them at all, it's in a novel that's about their affliction in which they're a victim. And I thought, not with any noble purpose, I thought, wow, this is great material because nobody's writing about characters like this. So I started including like a Down syndrome boy in a book or as in Devoted, Woody is an autistic boy who hasn't spoken in 11 years or in One Door Away from Heaven, a girl with some deformities. Um, and I found that this makes the characters, for me, more interesting, more real, and more sympathetic, because they don't just have the challenge of the villain in the book that's entering their lives, but they have the other challenges they face because of their different abilities or disabilities. And uh, that's where all that comes from. And it's an exciting and challenging thing to do. Uh, and it's given me a world of material that I don't see other people writing about. You got an email from someone who apparently gets your physical newsletter. You send these out. Uh, how often do you do this? Oh, a few times a year. It's a snail mail letter called Useless News. And uh, uh, I, I include two pages of photos of my dog with funny captions and little news about what's going on and this or that. It's just something we started doing a lot of years ago. And I think about stopping, but it's, it's kind of fun to do when people respond to it well. So the email we got says, in uh, Dean's uh, latest newsletter, he has a Kafka quote that says, all knowledge, the totality of all questions and all answers is contained in a dog. Uh, and the question is, if your dog could chime in about what we're going through today, um, if he thinks that is, uh, what might that be? Well, my dog Elsa is a she, and if I know Elsa well, she would say, this too shall pass. Uh, dogs do not get as ex exacerbated by things as we do. So, uh, and when I was having to write point of view of the dog in uh, Devoted, uh, that took a lot of thought. Uh, what would a dog be thinking? How would a dog respond? Uh, and I think uh, dogs tend not to get hysterical about much of anything, except occasionally seeing a squirrel or <laughs> something like that. But uh, the, the kind of panic that human beings are prone to, I don't think a dog would ever re react to any situation with the degree of panic we see now. Writing a novel is sometimes like making love and sometimes like having a tooth pulled and sometimes like making love while 
having a tooth pool <laughs> is uh, an email from a lady in North Carolina, incidentally. She says, ask Dean to tell us more about that. Yeah, that's something I said a lot of years ago. And what I mean is when it's going well, it's, it's the most glorious experience. Uh, when you're sitting there alone in a room and a character starts to work, you start hearing that voice of the character and it sounds as real to you as any person you've ever known. That is almost orgasmic kind of feeling and it lasts a very long time when you're writing about that character. And then there's days when no matter how hard you're trying, you can strain for 10 hours and get a paragraph out. Those are the days that are like having a tooth pulled. And sometimes when you're writing something you don't wanna write, maybe it involves the death of a character you've come to like very much uh, and you don't want to do it but it's going well uh, that's the time that it's both as exciting as making love because it's going well and it's as terrible as having a tooth pulled because you're killing off a character that you particularly love or putting the character through something you wish they didn't have to go through but it's part of the story and you have to do it dean i love your dialogue how do you come up with your dialogue um i i I guess I have an ear for it because uh, it's always been something I love to do when I, that's how character comes out often is how people speak. Uh, and advice I give young writers, if they find themselves using a lot of dialogue type tags to tell you who is saying every line of dialogue, something has gone wrong because the character's dialogue should be so distinct to that character that you have no doubt knowing who is speaking. Uh, it's, it's a challenge for character work. And as I said earlier, I came to believe a long time ago that character is the center of fiction. It matters more than story. Story can be great, and it has to be. You have to compel the reader through the story. But if the characters aren't vivid and compelling and interesting, if the, if the antagonist doesn't raise the hair on the back of your neck and make you want to spit, then he's not a good antagonist. And if the lead characters don't make you sort of fall in love with them to some extent, I don't think you've done your job as a writer. So, um, so that's sort of where I'm going with all of that. I think I have forgot your question and, and babbling, but maybe I answered it. No, you did very well. It, the, the, the question was somebody impressed with your dialogue. I have a follow up, oh. that, Dean. Uh, I don't know how many of the 38 languages you've been translated to you know, but how well does that dialogue translate? I often wonder about that. Uh, years and years ago, I had a problem in France uh, and Germany because I was a well, I had had five years of French. I can't speak it. If you don't keep speaking it, it just goes away. But I can read it to some extent. And I began to recognize the French were cutting the prose rather substantially. And the Germans were doing the same thing. And I had to lay down a rule, no cutting full translation. Uh, but other than that, I do sometimes wonder how that dialogue is translated, what it must be like in another language. And I, I fear a lot of the quality and color of it will be lost uh, unless you're in the hands of an excellent translator. You know, that is sort of similar to audiobooks. Uh, when you have a really good narrator in an audiobook, they bring something extra to it. Uh, but if it's not a really good audio narrator, something gets lost that the reader would get themselves if they read it themselves. So there's only so much you can control. And actually, there's very little in life we can control. I can control what I get on the page for the US and British editions. And after that, it's not, I, I'm, I, have, no, I have no strength to handle that. I can't go to all these countries to do it. You just hope for the best. Dean, we have a bunch of questions about writing and the craft of writing and, and your process and so on. So we'll go through some of those. Um, somebody asks, do you work on multiple projects at the same time? I have an obsessive mind. So I, once I get focused on a story and a set of characters, I can't work on a second novel at the same time. I have to follow that through and focus on it. Strangest thing is I can write a, something of nonfiction while I'm working on a novel or I used to when I was doing screenplays and teleplays, I could do those and still write the novel and sort of spell myself off in a day and say, okay, I've had enough of that, I'll do some of this. Um, but since I'm not doing those anymore and sticking straight with the novels, uh, it's one thing at a time. And that's because I get lost in the world of the novel. 
And in that 10 hour day when I'm sitting there lost in it, it becomes very much more vivid to me and therefore I'm able to make it more vivid to the reader. And if I was going back and forth between multiple projects, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to do that. Often the, the question comes up, um, you know, about outlining, do you outline? We had uh, John Irving on our stage who said at the beginning of a book, he knows what the last sentence in a book is. So several questions about that. Uh, do you know how a novel is gonna end when you start it? Do you outline? I, I used to outline, uh, and then with a book called Strangers, I stopped. And it was a huge cast. It was a quarter of a million words with many storylines in it. And I just decided that outlines didn't work for me because once I got into the book, I would start changing things. Better ideas would occur to me. And then the, uh, you'd start to feel like, well, I can't do that because I've got this outline and I'm pushing the character this way. It got to feel, outlines got to feel to me like I was manipulating the characters, letting, instead of letting them come alive and tell their story. So ever since, and that was back in the early 80s, I've never, uh, never outlined anything since. And I just begin with a premise, a certain little bit of an idea. I may have a certain scene or two that seems natural to grow out of that. And then I also have characters. If I start with a couple of characters that I'm going to like, and I'm going to know that in 10 to 15 pages. If I don't like them, I should stop writing about them. I should go on to something else. Um, but normally, if I got strong characters, then I give them free will. Young writers say to me, how do you give them free will? You're creating them. They're not real people. In a strangest way, they become real people if they're working. And they take the story places you would never take it yourself. And this happens to me all the time. I remember in the early stages of a novel called Life Expectancy, I had two expectant fathers in a expectant father's lounge in a hospital. And I knew one of them was the father of, of the boy who was about to be born who was going to be the hero of the novel. And the other one was gonna be somebody that plagued him the rest of his life. But I didn't know exactly who that character was. I had a name for him. I knew he was going to be sitting in the lounge because this took place many years ago, chain smoking. And by the time I got to the fact that he was chain smoking, I actually typed, and, and then the other, uh, the other father in the lounge was a chain smoking clown. And I stopped dead as I typed the word clown and thought, what am I doing? Clown? How can this guy be a clown? And how can my antagonist in this book, that's gonna be an antagonist for decades for this character, be a clown? And then I had had enough experience of letting this, the character tell you what's right and not second guessing them. So I continued and he said, okay, he's not a clown with big red shoes. He's more of an Emmett Kelly clown in a shabby suit with little makeup on and stuff like that. And there's a circus in town and his wife's giving birth. And it turned out that novel became, I think one of the best things I've ever done. And uh, wouldn't have been that novel if he hadn't been a clown. So it's learning to trust the characters you're creating and they'll tell you in their own voice what is going to happen to them. It's a very mysterious thing, but when you get there, it's one of the greatest things about writing is giving yourself over to these people you've created and letting them run. Dean, what is your daily writing routine? What time of the day do you start? How long do you go for? What interruptions do you allow yourself? Um, I'm not online in my office. Uh, my assistant is online, so if I need to learn something from an online source in research, I come over to this office. But uh, in my office, I stay away from that because I know I'm obsessive and I'd spend all day on the internet. Uh, I, I get up at five in the morning usually. Uh, by 6.30, I've walked the dog, fed the dog, uh, gotten myself ready for the day, and I'm at my desk. I have breakfast at the desk. I rarely eat lunch and uh, I work straight through to dinner. That usually takes place six days a week. Toward the end of a novel, when it's, the momentum is really there and you, you can maintain it with less effort than when you're earlier, in earlier stages of a novel. I've been known to go to seven days a week uh, to do that. Uh, that's why I've been so prolific. It isn't that I write fast, because I don't. So that's six months 
the six months of 60 to 70 hour weeks. Uh, and I love that, however, because I'm immersed in the storyline and I'm able to vividly experience it. And I think that's why I get so much mail from people that say they almost feel like they're watching a movie when they read the book because things are vividly described. And I think that comes out of these work habits. Speaking of the internet, not that that's the only place to do research, we have a question about research. Um, I want to know what Dean Koontz does for research. For example, in your book, Your Heart Belongs to Me, it involved a heart transplant. What did you do to learn about heart surgery? Well, there's a number of things. Uh, I, I always remember in an early book, uh, Stranger, not that early, but his first bestseller I had in hardcover, Strangers, had a, one of the characters was a surgeon and she pre pre performed an aortal graft. And I wrote the whole scene by researching it through medical books. There was no online research at that time. And I got medical texts. Uh, I studied it uh, as if I was going for a medical exam. And after I'd written it, I thought there's going to be all kinds of mistakes with this. Uh, so I gave it to my family doctor and I said, do you know a, uh, a cardiovascular surgeon that might be able to read this and vet it for me? And he said, oh yeah, I know somebody at St. Joseph's and uh, gave the book to this surgeon and the surgeon came back to me and said, it's entirely accurate, which was kind of fascinating to me that you could do it and a surgeon who does this for a living would say, there's nothing wrong with this. Now that we've got the internet, it becomes even easier because there's more access to things. But also over the years, the more successful the books became, the more I would get letters from readers who would say, uh, I'm a lawyer, if there's anything you ever need to know about the law that you're writing, or I'm a surgeon, or this is my specialty, and here's my phone number. So I have basically a sort of second Rolodex in a drawer, and I have all these people who are specialists in all kinds of things that are asking me to call them and pick their brains if I need to. It's surprising how seldom you need to these days, given all that you can get on the internet, but it's still a very valuable resource. So always going to the person who does something uh, and knows it backward and forward is a, is a grace. That's why I'm, I write sometimes about police officers and things because I've known quite a number of them and can pick their brains too. Dean, at what point does someone other than you read a first draft? And when someone other than you reads a first draft, who is that person? I don't let anyone see one page of it until it's finished as good as I can get it. Um, I go through a lot of drafts a page, and then when I reach the end of a chapter, I print it out and, and pencil it two or three times. Uh, and when I'm at the end of the book, it's been gone through page by page so much, I don't go back at that point. Then I give the book to my wife, Jurda, who has always been my fairest and toughest critic. And uh, she reads it and tells me what she thinks. Uh, Sometimes if it's a deadline, it has to go to the uh, editor simultaneous, but often she gets to read it first. Um, and it's a delicate thing because uh, she'll be blunt. She'll tell me, you know, this scene needs this or this. And being male, you sometimes say, no, that's wrong, dear. I was doing something that I think you've missed there. And then you go into your office and you sit and brood about it. And then you do what she said because she's right. Uh, and Editorial has always been, it's always one of the most difficult things for writers because there are good editors and there's bad ones. Until you've worked a lot, it's hard to know whether an editor is good or bad. Uh, I've found that the best editors, the ones with the lightest touch, the ones who respect the work, who didn't, or even if they wanted to be a writer themselves, they don't want to be a writer at your expense. They don't want to change the book into something they would write. Uh, and a good editor will give you a lot of subtle notes and you can take them or leave them. And sometimes you leave them and sometimes you take them. Uh, but I've often said to writers who bristle at editors and I've known best-selling writers who when they get to be bestsellers, that's it. They don't want to edit it anymore. And I think I've said, well, the problem with that is on the book, it says a novel by Dean Koontz. It doesn't say a novel by Dean Koontz with some brilliant suggestions by. 
I get all the credit if I take their suggestions and they're good. So there's no reason not to take them. Uh, and I find a good editor can be very helpful. The names of some of the characters in your books uh, have interesting meaning and symbolism. Do you do this deliberately? Um, do you assume your readers will get this? Uh, or is it just a treat for those that do? Uh, it's just part of the texture of a novel. Uh, the names can be very important. They can be symbolic of things that are going on in subtext. Uh, they're a way, if the reader catches it, of making them think a little more seriously about the events this character is going through. Um, and it can be very obscure. It isn't something everybody needs to see. Uh, it's something you do for personal satisfaction. I've often said that in setting scene, in setting character, there are so many subtleties that work subconsciously on the reader that they don't have to get it consciously. It's there subconsciously and it helps shape their opinion of things. Um, one, of the, one of the books I've written, many of the characters in the books, their names are actually words in Hebrew uh, and they're per, per, they've been chosen for that. It's one of the Al Thomas novels. And when that novel first came out in Israel, it was funny to start getting all these letters. Do you know this is a word in Hebrew? Yes, that's why I used it. And uh, uh, it's, it's kind of fun when people see it. Uh, somebody told me your books are full of Easter eggs. And I guess that's a nice way to think about it, yeah. I hear that you read over 150 books a year. Um, first, how do you find the time to do that, given how busy you are? Uh, and then second, um, does reading other people's fiction impact your own writing? Well, let me make a little correction. When Jared and I were first married, the first 10 or 15 years of our life together, for the first 10 years, we never had a TV. We didn't want one. And we read a lot. And we both were reading close to 200 books a year. That is not the case anymore. I've gotten busier and busier and busier. And I read so much for research that reading fiction for pleasure is gone way, way down from there. But on, as for what I read, I read in every genre. Uh, and literary fiction for me is just another genre. Uh, and I read everything. I say to young writers, don't read just what you want to write. If you want to write mysteries, don't limit yourself to read mysteries. Read everything. Because the more, it's like that song by Jefferson Airplane, uh, the Dormouse said, feed your head. They're talking about drugs, but it works with books too. Feed your head with everything you read. And you're going to have an easier time getting ideas, and you're going to have more techniques that you learn about how to write that are going to be absorbed almost unconsciously as you read very, very uh, kind of fiction. So yes, everything you read does impact you. You know, I've known some writers who say, I don't want to read a lot of fiction because I don't want to end up writing like another writer. And I said, well, that's exactly the wrong way to go because what little writ fiction you're reading will then be the only fiction that affects you. And if you read a lot of fiction, the input will be from so many sources, you won't end up writing like any one of them. Uh, and that's another reason to broaden your horizons and read almost everything. How do you feel about sequels to some of your books? Um, and what is it about the odd Thomas that you re revisit him several times? Will there be a sequel to Watchers or any of your other books? Well, uh, odd Thomas was <clears throat> a unique character. Um, I, I have to feel compelled with character to go on for more than one book. And oftentimes you said about a character what you have to say, or at the end of it, it would be artificial to pick up that story and move it forward in sequel after sequel. But Odd Thomas was such an interesting character that I could see going on with him for a significant period of novels. And I also knew at the very beginning of the book that he was on a journey toward absolute humility. And I thought, how are you gonna write this? Uh, because I'm not absolutely humble. Uh, so it was gonna be a challenge and interesting to see where he would be at the end of it. And that made it worth writing. Or in the case of the Jane Hawk books, um, I. She was so interesting. She was such a tender character and yet such a kick-ass <laughs> that 
it was fun to see where she would go and what she would do. Uh, so character drives it, whether I can write more about the characters than just one book. But many things are standalones. And uh, at the end of it, you say, that's it. There's nothing more to be said. Which character in your books have you most despised and why? <laughs> uh, I think it's the antagonist in One Door Away from Heaven. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the protagonist in that, there are several, uh, but one of them is a, a girl who's I think 12 or 13. She has a, uh, she has a deformed uh, foot, a deformed hand, uh, and this has shaped her. Uh, but she's an indomitable spirit. And her mother is a terrible piece of work. Her mother is a drug addict uh, and is hooked up with a very bad man who is a highly educated man, but is a utilitarian bioethicist who believes that disabled people should not receive medication because they're a drag on society and who believes a lot of things that I find terrifying. Uh, and I came to really despise that character in the novel. Uh, and even my villains, I often don't end up despising, but that one I did. And when he had a very harsh ending, I was very happy about it. Here's another one about character. Um, which of your characters keeps you up all night? Do you think about wondering what they might be doing in their fictional world? Uh, once it's, if it's an se ongoing series, yes. Uh, I. I wonder sometimes uh, you know, I've got another novel in the works or I know I'm going to write another novel of that character. So it comes into my head, what are they doing? Or, or what happens more often is you'll be in a situation in life that is kind of odd uh, or uh, a little spooky moment and you think, what would this character do to handle this? Uh, I know what Jane Hawk would do, she'd take him out. <laughs> Uh, Odd Thomas would treat it in an entirely different way. So you think about that sort of thing sometimes. The, the good characters, the ones that resonate with you most as a writer, do stay with you long after the book they were in. Here's a question from an aspiring writer. Uh, I'm an aspiring writer, she says. I've had a few short stories published, but anything beyond that has been met with rejection, and I don't take it too well. I was not cut out to be a novelist, how did you deal with rejection early in your career? Uh, we all go through it. Uh, I, I always tell the story of John D. MacDonald, who went on to be one of the best-selling writers ever and one of the most respected among other writers. Uh, I can't tell you how many writers I've known of a certain generation who learned to write by reading John D. Uh, he had 75 rejection slips before he sold anything. And then he went on to be writing novelettes and things that were selling to Collier's and Saturday Evening Post for what in those days were small fortunes, $50,000 for a novelette, uh, which would be almost like half a million a day. Uh, and he went on to create so many memorable novels. Uh, you just have to persevere through it. You have to also kind of get an idea of why you're being rejected. Uh, so it takes a little bit of humility to say, maybe I'm being rejected for certain lacking in the writing, or maybe I'm being rejected because nobody gets what I'm trying to do, but I am doing it properly. Uh, from the outside, my career looks like it was this long, smooth arc that never had a hitch to it, but in fact, it was an endless struggle. And even after I had been on the bestseller list, uh, I was hit with arguments from my publisher at that time. Uh, when I delivered Lightning. By that point, I'd had a number of paperback bestsellers. I'd had two hardcover bestsellers. And I delivered Lightning and was told, I can't publish this book. It'll destroy your growing career because the lead character is a child for the first quarter of the novel, and that makes it a young adult novel. And I thought that was strange. I made arguments like, well, then Oliver Twist is a young adult novel. Uh, but nothing held water in that. And we struggled for six months until she finally agreed to publish it. Uh, and those kind of things happen a lot. They haven't happened to me in the last few years, but they continue to happen for a long, long time. Uh, I've told this story before, but when I first had a number one bestseller, uh, my publisher called me up because you know in advance it's going to be on the bestseller list. 
called me up to say, you're going to be number one on the New York Times. Before I could say, we'll be, she said, uh, but I want you to understand, you don't write the kind of novels that can be number one. So this will never happen to you again. And I had four more number ones with that publisher. And she continued to tell me it would never happen again. So the resistance to what you're doing is always there. And it's hard. Uh, but I had many rejections. I, I don't know if I had 75 like John Dee, but I had pretty much close to that. I sold the first short story I ever wrote, but that was just a fluke. Uh, then there were a number of short stories I sold and didn't sell, or wrote and didn't sell. I started selling paperback novels, and then I wrote probably seven or eight that never sold. Um, not always in a row, sometimes two in a row. And, uh, and then it got to the point where I was understanding what I was doing better. I was being more ambitious in what I was doing, and the rejection stopped. Uh, so it's something you have to persevere. You have to be able to take rejection uh, because you're going to get it. Sometimes it's unfair. Sometimes it's accurate. It's just learning to tell the difference. The question came from someone in an MFA program, just a follow up from me. Do you think writing can be taught? I think certain things can be taught. Uh, I had writing courses in college. Nothing I ever learned helped. <laughs> so I think it de depends on the teacher. I, th I think one thing I find sometimes disturbing about some of these programs, and I've seen it, there were, I don't know if this happens in all of them, it happens in many of them, where they teach you minimalist writing. They teach you to avoid metaphor, to avoid simile, to avoid a lot of imagery. Uh, they tell you don't use alliteration. Uh, they, they will tell you, what they're telling you to do is write like Ernest Hemingway, except the problem is Ernest Hemingway wrote minimalist, but there was enormous amount of stuff going on under the surface. Uh, you were seeing a story that was an iceberg. You were seeing the tip of it on the page and the rest of it was hitting you subconsciously. But that's not what they're teaching you to do and that can't be taught. That's genius and you either have it or you don't. Uh, so when they teach minimalist writing, I think it's a great mistake because it's like if you were a cabinet maker and you wanted to build beautiful cabinets, but you said, I'm not going to use a drill, and I'm not going to use a saw, and I'm, I'm not going to use an awl. I'm just going to do this with the minimal of tools. Then you're never going to build beautiful cabinetry. You need to have all the tools that are in an arsenal of a writer. And the English language is deep, profoundly complex, and beautiful. And if you're not going to use it in every way it can be used, then you're never going to write at the level that you could be writing at. And I've run into too many writers who've got it in their heads that you need to cut everything to make writing good. Uh, not everybody can be Elmore Leonard. Elmore Leonard can write minimalist and have impact, but most of us need every tool we can get to, to put the reader through the ringer. Dean, here's one. Um, over the last several novels dating back 10 years or so, I noticed more of your Catholic Christian background entering into the hope some of your characters possess. What novel did this transition occur in, assuming you agree with this, and why did it occur after so many years of your worldview uh, of one not being close to God? The questioner adds, I read this in your biography. Uh, well, I sort of grew up, <laughs> and uh, the world became more wondrous and complex to me as I got older. And I've read a lot of science, and I, uh, uh, I don't read science for uh, story ideas. I end up getting them from reading it, but it's not the intention. I'm just fascinated with certain areas of science, molecular biology, quantum mechanics. And the more I started reading in those areas, the more complex life started to look to me. And that got me back to the idea that there's meaning in life. And whether it's uh, intelligent design, whether it's, you know, some people say aliens invented us. Uh, I don't happen to think that solves any problem because if aliens made us, then who made the aliens? Uh, it's, it's a Chinese box sort of issue. Uh, so I think what came into the books was not so much uh, religious, belief as the belief that life has meaning and purpose and that I saw 
it's there in the web and woof of everything in life. Um, and when you read molecular biology and you see how incredibly complex everything is and how one little thing would go off the rails, then it's, we wouldn't have, it's an anthropic universe. It's, it has, it facilitates life. And if there wasn't one of the 20 universal constants, constant, constants that was any bit different, then the universe would not permit life at all. And the, the chances of that being true, if you have to, you can't write it in normal uh, notation for all 20 constants to be what they are, to allow life in the universe is a number that you have to do it with other notation. It's 10 to a power so high that to write it out by normal numeric writing would take you about a million years and you'd have to be writing 24 hours a day. That is a very rare thing to have happened by happenstance. So as I got older and was reading the science and quantum mechanics and thinking about spooky effects at a distance that quantum mechanics deals with, one of the many things it deals with, uh, I started to think, okay, life is more interesting and strange than, and, than a totally secular viewpoint makes it. Now that doesn't mean I buy everything and every faith either, uh, but it does mean there's more happening out there in our lives than we give credit to, to if we just say everything is only what it appears to be. You've probably been wondering, being that we are in LA, when do the questions about film and adaptation come? <laughs> well, here we go. We have a lot of questions, so very specific to some books in particular. So I'm going to try to keep it as general uh, as we can here. Um, how do you feel about your work being adapted? Do you uh, do the adapting yourself? Do you like to do the adapting yourself? Um, any comments about some of your work that has been adapted? Um, there are some writers who feel if someone wants to adapt it and the check clears, that's fine, and they let it be. Do you, do you continue to feel attached to the work? I, uh, for years, I thought if, if I involve myself in the writing of it and in the producing of it, that will make a difference. Uh, gradually, I learned it didn't make much of a difference. I, uh, I create, I was, some producers came to me and wanted me to create and they said, reinvent Dracula. And I said, well, Dracula is reinvented about every three years. Why don't we invent something, reinvent something else? And that I suggested was Frankenstein. And we sold it to a network. Uh, I wrote the pilot script first. I wrote it on spec. We sold it to a network. The network said, will you expand this into two hours uh, so that we can launch the series with a, a bang? And I said, yes. So while I was working on it, and expanding it into two hours, uh, the agent that was handling the project took it to a young director and got the young director involved. No offer had been made, but at the same time, the head of the agency gave it to Martin Scorsese, not knowing it had been given to another director. Marty came back and said he had not directed anything for television except documentaries. He came back and said, I would like this to be the first fiction piece I direct for television. And I thought, wow, now we have an 800 pound gorilla in the room. So this is going to get done properly. Unfortunately, he found out that this other young director had been being discussed as a possibility. And he said, I will never take work away from a young director, but I'd still like to be involved in this. I'd like to be on the producing end of this. So he became one of the producers and he was making gangs in New York at the time. And he was in every meeting by phone. He was absolutely scrupulous about it. And he was brilliant in all of it. And I got to think quite an interesting and decent human being. And uh, I don't always think about that and get that kind of idea out of Hollywood, but I did with him. And then one day, as we were getting close to the point it had been cast, uh, and we were getting close to where you would start getting a start date on it. And I discovered that behind my back, another writer had been brought into the project. And I bristled. I said, I created this. This is what it's supposed to be. What are you doing to this? And the best way I can tell you is it was so obnoxious that, and it was so misogynistic that I said, I can't have my name on this. 
So I had to go to my attorney. I had to wrench my name out of it as creator, screenwriter, and executive producer. And when all of this blew up, a couple of weeks later, I got a letter from Marty. And it was the sweetest letter. He said, when I read your original script, I would have shot it word for word as it was written. And when I found out they were bringing in another writer and they were changing things, I called up the producer and said, surely you're not changing this, or surely you're not changing that. And unfortunately, they were changing everything. And that's when I said, I'm not doing this anymore, because if you can have Martin Scorsese on the project, who wants to shoot it as it was, and people will still mess around with it, then my time is better spent elsewhere. But that said, then I was approached by Steve Somers, the director, about Odd Thomas. And we had a two-hour conversation in which he caught the character so perfectly. Then he went away and wrote a script. I let him have an option. He wrote the most brilliant script. It excited me. I can't tell you. I couldn't even make a note on the script. It was so good. And Steve wanted to raise the money without a studio so that he didn't have anybody telling him to change things. And he raised it. The two of us went to a film market for two days. And he raised it by selling off foreign territories. Except that once he was in Santa Fe shooting the movie, some people showed up who were responsible for the money end of it and said, oh, the money has dried up and we don't have 30 million after all. We don't have any more in fact at all. And Steve was so beloved by the crew and actors that he was able to have them stay in Santa Fe at their own expense for a month while he went to see if he could raise the money to finish the picture. He raised some more money. I'm afraid to think he raised some of it out of his own pocket and went back to Santa Fe and finished it, but no longer at a $30 million picture. So he never got to realize the script, but I thought it was still pretty darn good. And that movie never got a, a release in theaters because there were so many legal entanglements by it. And But for Steve's commitment, it would have never been finished. Those rights have now come back to me. So I own Odd Thomas all over again, and I'm hopeful that might go somewhere else. But those two little stories will tell you why. I don't invest my heart in that medium because you may have great success, but it will be largely happenstance, I think. And I've had some good things done. I thought the miniseries of Intensity was quite good in many ways. Okay, so what movies and TV shows do you like? Uh, well, um, I recent, well, of course, I love Breaking Bad. I binge watch. I, I can't get myself to tune in the same time every week. So I wait till I can get the whole season and binge watch it, usually on DVD, because that's just the way I'd rather like it rather than streaming it. And uh, I love Breaking Bad. And probably I may be alone in this, but I like Better Call Saul even better than Breaking Bad. I think Bob Odenkirk is in Revelation and uh, uh, I forget her first name, but her last name is Seahorn, uh, who plays his love interest in that series, is equally marvelous. And the writing in those shows are breathtaking because they will stop and give you something that other series would cover in 10 seconds, 15 seconds, in order to just keep the pace jumping. And uh, uh, the, the creator of that show will pause for a minute minute and a half and let the scene really sink in. And it's riveting for those reasons. So that's been the favorite thing I've watched recently. Uh, I am not a guy who likes to watch bloody things at all. I have a low tolerance for bloody movies. So there's a lot of things I won't watch. But my wife came to me and said, because she stays up later than I do. She's more of a night owl. And so she'll watch something while I'm going to bed. And she came to me and said, you got to watch these movies, John Wick. And I said, are you kidding me? I know these are bloodbaths and I am not going to like these movies. She said, no, there's something astonishing going on in these movies and you've really got to watch them. And I watched them, they're as violent as anything I've ever seen, but she's absolutely right. There is something going on in these movies that's kind of utterly strange and interesting. And it's interesting that critics, some really good ones like Joe Morgenstern, have begun to find that there is something in these John Wick movies that lift them up and make the violence something other than what it appears to be. 
Uh, and those movies are filled with all kinds of strange symbolism and interesting uh, literary references that are not meant to be rubbed in your face, but do support these movies in a way that a lot of others aren't. Speaking of a different kind of adaptation, uh, comics and graphic novels. Um, do your books or your characters, have they been adapted into graphic novels or, uh, or comics? And how do you feel about that? I've had some adapted into comics. It's interesting to see them in another medium. Uh, if it goes badly wrong, it's not as embarrassing as a really bad film because not as many people are seeing it. Uh, I did some work in manga, that Japanese format, um, that I find very appealing. Uh, and I worked with a really good artist in some of those, and we did a few odd Thomas stories outside the novels. And it's interesting to see the art and an interesting artist take it and create it, and a, a writer who can come in. And however, I find myself working with the writers because the dialogue of the characters in those books was such that I really had to go through and, and rewrite dialogue in a lot of places so that it was more in character. But after a few of them, I thought, no, this is another use of my time that isn't as wise as it could be. And so I went back to novels and I don't think I'll be doing more manga. Dean, uh, what was it like writing the nameless series of novelettes uh, with our attention span getting shorter and shorter with the distraction of devices and screens. Do you see this as a growing trend for storytelling? Well, it was interesting because I hadn't yet moved to Amazon or ever even thought I would, but they came to me to write a novelette. The first one was Ricochet Joe, which did very, very well. And uh, then they asked me if I would write a series of six novelettes with the same character. And I came up with the idea for Nameless, and I wrote those. And I had just the greatest time with them. I approached them differently than I had approached novelettes before that. I said, how can you take the contents of a novel and boil it down into 15,000 words or whatever and get the reader feeling they've almost had a novel experience? And that has to do with the vividness of the language, the, the kind of character work you do, and doing it in a more succinct way. And they were great fun to write, and they were well received by Amazon. And after three months, I think we passed two million downloads for this series. Uh, and I think it's brought me new readers. Uh, and I think I will do more of that. I love the form. Uh, novelettes more than short stories, because you've got more room to play with in a novelette. And uh, it gives you a chance. You know, when you start a novel, and it's going to be six months of long hours uh, writing before you say, done. In this case, it's two, three weeks, and that is a great happy moment. And to have six happy moments uh, in the time you would have one if you had been writing just a novel is a boon to the writer. So I think I'll keep doing some of these. Uh, another question. Um, you've written two books uh, about writing popular fiction, um, and I often see tips for writers in your newsletter. Um, any chance you might write another book on the craft of writing or a memoir? Uh, well, first of all, the first of those writing books I wrote when I was young and stupid. I was stupid much longer than I was young, uh, but I was young and stupid and some of the advice I would never get today. And in the other one, how to write best-selling fiction, some of it still applies, but everything has changed. So I wouldn't recommend those sources. I I do give tips now and then in a little snail mail newsletter or sometimes on posts that I do. Uh, and they come out of things that I read in, that people do. And there were maybe sometimes things I did when I was starting out and you learn, uh, don't do that. Uh, and one of them is uh, uh, don't use endless number of dialogue tags, uh, uh, sadisms. Uh, he said, he asked, she said, she asked occasionally something else to emphasize it. But if you find yourself saying, he shouted, she exclaimed, uh, she, he said grimly, uh, uh, it's, you don't need to do that. If the dialogue is good, then we hear it because it's the character. And each character will sound a little bit different in the ear. And those dialogue tags just get in the way of things. Uh, besides which, uh, 
Bill Grinley said. It sounds like his name is Bill Grinley. Uh, so you don't want to confuse situations with that. I might do a book that's a little more about a, a writing memoir that would have observations about things I've learned. I don't know I'd do a textbook directly, but there's so many funny stories about writing. I have a book I've started called uh, Too Happy for My Own Good, because as I was a, a child, I had an aunt who knew what my household was like. And I was never an unhappy child in spite of all this. And she thought I should be. So she would say to me, sort of lecturing me, you are too happy, you are too happy for your own good, which I always thought was a strange thing to tell a child. Um, and I'm writing a sort of memoir about childhood, but also writing that will tell funny stories that are instructive uh, about growing up in a bad environment and also making it as a writer. And that will involve some writer scenes from time to time. A couple more questions, Dean, and we'll let you go. Um, I know you love your love for dogs and your writing, and both those obviously consume a lot of your time. What are some of your other curiosities and interests? Uh, writing pretty much consumes me. I, I love music. Uh, I collect old Bakelite radios uh, from the 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, if, no, if you haven't ever seen them, they're most beautiful objects. Radio was uh, you know, largely the way people were mostly entertained in that period. Uh, movies were big, but radio was bigger. And in those days, in the Art Deco period, they made everyday objects beautiful. Uh, there are people who collect mix masters from the deco period because they're so pretty. And some people collect uh, electric fans from the deco period. But when I first saw a deco period radio, and there were numerous companies making radios, and they would make new models every year. And these things are like works of art. They're the first plastic that was used for these things, and it was Bakelite. And Bakelite jewelry is now hugely expensive. So these radios become difficult to find and then they have to be restored. But I have shelves of them in my office and it just pleases me to look at them. Uh, so that's, that's one of my eccentricities. Um, but fortunately I didn't ask about eccentricities. That's a long list, but interests, Bakelite radios, music. Music informs writing a lot, depending on what I'm listening to. Uh, the Jane Hawk books feature a, a protagonist who is a, a pianist. And what she listens to has a lot to do with what I listens to, listen to. And she listens to everything from Fats Domino to, uh, Fats Domino to uh, um, uh, Mozart. And uh, that's sort of me, I'm eclectic in that thing. I like big band music, Paul Simon. I can, I can sing almost everything Paul Simon's ever written. Not well, but I can sing it. So our, our last question, a great one to end on, is a music question. Uh, lady emails, in your newsletter you say, piano jazz master and composer David Benoit has written the ballad of Jane Hawk, uh, one of your characters. Um, and you say in the newsletter, um, it is a totally cool number that captures my Jane so well that when I listen to it, I can see her. Can you describe that to us? Describe the song or? <laughs> Describe that feeling, that moment. Uh, well, it's, it, David is a very sweet man too, and very talented. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, it, it's very strange to see. It's like, it, it's similar to what happens when you see a character, an actor play a character and you go, oh my, that's him. Uh, and when you hear music that was tailored to be, a, now this is, this is a musical number, it's, uh, he's a composer. Um, and it's, it's uh, uh, when you hear that music and it evokes the character, that is unique experience for me. I haven't heard that before, but it is akin to, I remember when Steve Summers wanted to uh, cast Anton Yelkin for, uh, for Odd Thomas. And I said, oh, I don't know. I don't know who he is. And he said, look at this, look at that. And I was reluctant. And then when I started seeing him playing Odd Thomas, I knew Steve was exactly right. He was not my image of uh, Thomas, but he captured the character amazingly. And that is a chill up the back experience, whether it's a piece of music or an actor's performance. And you, you've connected with somebody else creative who gets what you're doing and is able to translate it 
into another medium. And that is a kind of miraculous thing. Well, Dean, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the time you've given us. We look forward to rescheduling our event with you in the fall. Good luck with Devoted. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Ted.